the Catholic Church has had its fair share of awful popes, and few deserve to be on that list like Sixtus IV. Sixtus sullied the papacy with corruption, nepotism, and political scheming, as well as creating one of the most feared institutions in all of human history. In this video, we delve into the life of Pope Sixtus IV and the unspeakable deeds that earned him his fierce reputation. But before that, I want to mention a story on Manifest XM that I've been listening to, Blue Eyes, Blonde Hair. A young girl in a small town in Indiana discovers she has 94 half-siblings, all of them with blue eyes and blonde hair. There was nothing in common but one fertility clinic run by Dr. Donald Klein. The unspeakable things that one doctor at a fertility clinic did lead to the birth of hundreds of children who are now left to wonder who their father really was. It's one of those stories that reminds you that evil isn't just in big name historical figures, but can hide in the most unexpected places. By the way, Manifest XM is the Netflix of audio and specializes in making bingeable audiobooks that you just can't stop listening to. Lately, we've been listening to a lot of their true crime stories, like Inside the Mind of a Murderer, The Bizarre Story of Jeffrey Dahmer, America's Most Bizarre Criminal, and Mean Girls, the story of how two high school girls killed their friend to hide their gay relationship. You'll want to delve into the massive library of audiobooks and documentaries on Manifest XM. Their app offers a huge selection of unskippable documentaries that you can take with you on the go on anything from true crime to ancient history. With Manifest XM, you never have to stop learning and listening. You can download the file to listen on your daily commute or when you're out for a walk. Late night listeners can even use the sleep timer to manage your listening before bed. You can start your free trial of Manifest XM and start listening today. And if you use our code SECRET, you'll get the first month of access to this colossal library for just $1. Just follow the link in the description. Born Francesco della Rovere in July 1414, the future Pope Sixtus IV came from a relatively poor family. At a young age, he joined the Franciscan order where his charisma and intelligence were quickly revealed. He spent his youth learning what he could about philosophy and theology at the University of Pavia. He wrote influential treatises on Thomas Aquinas and the Immaculate Conception, but it would be his traveling lectures across Italy that cemented his reputation as one of the leading men of the Franciscan order. His travels brought him into contact with many of Italy's most powerful men, including the Duke of Milan and countless cardinals, who would one day help raise him to incredible power. Although he gave himself to his religious work, Francesco never forgot his family. Thanks to several siblings, Francesco ended up with many nephews who he treated almost as his own sons, educating them and working to advance their social position. The most important of these nephews were Girolamo and Pietro Diario, from his sister's marriage into the Diario family, along with Giuliano and Giovanni della Rovere from his brother. Francesco would craft all of them into tools to further the family's goals and his papal ambition. Eventually, Francesco's work and connections paid off when he was selected as Minister General of the Franciscan Order in 1464, and he finally became a cardinal in 1467 by appointment of Pope Paul II. However, Pope Paul died unexpectedly in 1471. Francesco rolled the dice and finally had cause to exploit the assets he had built. His lectures and written works had already endeared him to the College of Cardinals that selected the next pope. With the support of the Duke of Milan, who he'd met some years prior during his travels, and well-placed promises from his nephews to reward the cardinals who voted for him, Francesco secured his election to the papacy. He was crowned under the name Sixtus IV in St. Peter's Square on August 25, 1471, beginning a reign that would upend Italian politics and reshape Catholicism for centuries to come.
Upon becoming Pope, Sixtus abused his new position to shower gifts on his family. Within a year, Sixtus's sisters had elaborate houses in Rome and every luxury they desired. His nephews, Pietro and Giuliano, were immediately made cardinals despite being completely unqualified for the position. Pietro was made a bishop and then the Archbishop of Florence in 1473. Pietro was close to his uncle and effectively ran Sixtus's foreign policy until his sudden death later in 1473. Meanwhile, Giovanni was made the lord of papal lands in Senegalia and Mondavio and given a favorable marriage to a daughter of the powerful Montefeltro family. But perhaps the most richly rewarded nephew was Girolamo Riario, who was made captain general of the church, effectively in full control of the papacy's military resources, and was made the lord of Imola, a recently acquired city that would cause a cascade of problems in time. He was also married off to the daughter of the Duke of Milan, and in 1480 was made the lord of the city of Forli as well. Thanks to Sixtus's nepotism, no fewer than six of his nephews were made cardinals. Sixtus also poured honors onto other friends and allies, such as his friend Francesco Salviati, who was made the Archbishop of Pisa. In fact, of the 34 cardinals created during his papacy, almost none of them were properly qualified. This corruption did not go unnoticed. Stefano Infesura, a prominent critic who lived in Rome during Sixtus's reign, wrote a scathing description of the man. He was, quote, an impious and unjust king who had no fear of God, no love of governing the Christian people with no affection for charity or love, only caring for dishonest pleasure, greed, and vanity. Infesora had his own theories for why Sixtus appointed so many cardinals. According to rumors, Sixtus was a closeted homosexual who gave out cardinal positions to his illicit lovers. There's no solid evidence, but most historians agree that this was a widespread belief among his critics at the time. Outside of his nepotism and private life, Sixtus showed an eagerness for power. For example, he had a serious disagreement with the King of France over the king's insistence that all papal decrees needed his royal assent before being obeyed in France. Sixtus thirsted for the glory of the old papacy, whose power was unchallenged and extensive. The glory days of the Crusades were long gone, but that didn't stop Sixtus calling for them multiple times. His efforts produced unremarkable results. He also wanted to be the Pope to reunite Catholicism with the Orthodox East, another papal pipe dream that was never going to work. And once again, his lofty ambitions came to nothing, and he achieved no meaningful progress towards that goal. It seemed that Sixtus pursued his own ego and dreams of a glorious papacy before anything else, and every time met with disappointment. To his credit, Sixtus proved a far better ruler of Rome than of the Catholic Church. Sixtus's road pavements and bridge works significantly improved the city's infrastructure, and he had dozens of churches restored throughout the city. Sixtus was also a true patron of the Renaissance, acting as a patron to a number of scientists and artists including Botticelli. He extended this support for knowledge abroad, such as in Sweden where he approved the creation of the country's first university in Uppsala. In the Vatican itself, he commissioned so much work on the Vatican Library that he became known as its second founder. But his greatest legacy was in the elaborate chapel he had built and named after himself, the Sistine Chapel. While Michelangelo's iconic ceiling painting wouldn't come until years after his death, the Sistine Chapel was still a marvel of art and architecture and an enduring monument to Sixtus's investment in Rome. However, this work cost money. Money that Sixtus raised in two main ways. First, he sold indulgences, allowing people to buy their way out of sin. 
Second, he committed simony, the selling of priestly offices. Both of these were blatantly corrupt but hardly new for the Catholic Church at the time. Sixtus's corruption wasn't unique on this front, but it was symptomatic of the pervasive corruption that had consumed the church by the late 15th century. One of Sixtus' most famous acts began in an unexpected place, Spain. By the 1470s, Spain had been unified by the marriage of Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile. Centuries of Muslim control of the region was ended by the Reconquista, leaving a large population of Muslims and Jews in the new Catholic Kingdom. This inevitably produced social tension, which the monarchs were eager to resolve. They wanted to create social stability, and they felt the only way to do that was to ensure a clear separation between the different faiths and prevent the spread of heretical ideas to Christians. The Catholic Church already had an old provision that could do just that, and Spain would seek its resurrection. They asked the Pope for an inquisition. On the 1st of November 1478, at the request of Ferdinand and Isabella, Pope Sixtus IV issued a papal bull to create the legendary Spanish Inquisition. The Inquisition had sweeping powers to detain, interrogate, and torture people on the slightest accusation. This fell particularly hard on Spain's Jews, who were already subject to intense anti-Semitism. Word of the Inquisition's cruel tortures spread quickly, and Sixtus was forced to distance himself from them in 1482. He revoked some of their powers and pursued tighter church control over their actions. But whether he was truly disturbed by their actions or he just wanted to take more control is up for debate. Although nominally loyal to the Pope, the Inquisition was truly under the command of the Spanish crown, and Sixtus and Ferdinand spent 1482 locked in a battle of wills, over who should exert more control over it. In the end, Ferdinand won out, and the Pope was forced to back down on all of his criticisms out of fear that Ferdinand would permanently break the Inquisition away from papal power. Sixtus also agreed to consolidate all of the Inquisition under a single leader that he approved of, Tomás de Torquemada. In exchange, Sixtus and Ferdinand reconciled and the king withdrew his threats to end papal authority over the organization. Torquemada became Inquisitor General of the Spanish Inquisition and turned the Inquisition's actions up to 11. Torquemada would burn over 2,000 people and torture countless more in his zealous attempt to stamp out heresy in Spain. More importantly for Sixtus though, his authority had been preserved and all of his complaints vanished. Sixtus wrote to Torquemada after he began his work, praising him for having, quote, directed your zeal to those matters which contribute to the praise of God and the benefit of the Orthodox faith. It seems that he had never truly been bothered by torture at all, so long as the people doing it acknowledged his authority. The Inquisition would endure for years. In 1492, it was Torquemada and the Inquisition that spearheaded the expulsion of all Jews from Spain. That same year, Columbus would reach the Americas, where the Inquisition would soon earn its more fearsome reputation as a vicious persecutor of non-Christians and a key player in the destruction of Native American cultures during Spanish colonization. But Sixtus did most of his meddling in Italy itself. In order to raise his nephew Girolamo Riario to a sufficient level to marry the Duke of Milan's daughter, Sixtus had to acquire the city of Imola. However, this put him at odds with a dangerous man, Lorenzo de Medici. The Medici were a powerful Florentine banking family who acted as the papacy's main bankers. When Sixtus sought a loan to purchase Imola, the Medici refused. Furious, Sixtus went to a rival Florentine family, the Pazzi, and began using them as his primary bankers instead. 
Between the disagreement over Imola and the banking change, Sixtus and the Medici were at each other's throats. Things weren't helped when Lorenzo fiercely opposed the appointment of Sixtus's friend, Francesco Salviati, yet another powerful Florentine, as Archbishop of Pisa. Clearly, the Medici were a thorn in the side of the papacy and its allies, and something had to be done. That something became known as the Pazzi Conspiracy. Around 1477, Salviati, Jacopo de Pazzi, and Girolamo Riario became the ringleaders of a plot to eliminate the Medici and take control of Florence. Meetings were held in the Vatican as the men considered how to carry out their scheme. Sixtus tried to keep his distance, but he was fully aware of what was being done. He was quoted as saying, I want that government taken from Lorenzo's hands, because he's a villain and a wicked man. Once he's out of Florence, we'll be able to do as we wish. Reportedly, Sixtus's only stipulation was that no one would be killed. However, there was no way it could be bloodless. Sixtus must have known that when the conspirators began talking out their plans and arranging for a mercenary army to support their coup. They sprung their plot on Sunday 26th of April, 1478, as Lorenzo and his brother were attending mass at Florence Cathedral. The conspiracy was a chaotic disaster. Although they killed Lorenzo's younger brother, the wounded Lorenzo escaped. Alas, not with the help of any mysterious assassins, and Florence became a battlefield. Dozens of people died in street fighting as armed soldiers and the populace rose up. Not, as the plotters hoped, against the Medici, but against the plotters. By the end of the day, the conspirators were defeated. Dozens were dead or captured, and many more would follow as Lorenzo hunted down those who fled. Salviati and Jacopo de Pazzi were both killed, although Girolamo himself was not present. Sixtus was furious. After the survivors exposed the Pope's involvement, Sixtus excommunicated Lorenzo and the entire Florentine leadership and placed the whole city under interdict, meaning they weren't allowed to take mass or communion. Florence responded carefully, publishing and circulating the confessions of the conspirators that implicated the Pope, but not going too far and risking being accused of attacking the papacy. Still, Sixtus's actions effectively legitimized any and all aggression against Florence. Shortly after, Sixtus's ally, the King of Naples, launched an invasion of Florence, starting a war that inflicted suffering and death on both sides. However, Sixtus had underestimated Lorenzo. Through bold diplomacy, Lorenzo managed not only to make peace, but to ally himself with the King of Naples. Sixtus had been thwarted. His plot had failed, Lorenzo had turned the papacy's allies into Florence's, and the Medici were more powerful than ever. Seeking to compensate for a clear loss, Sixtus navigated the complex web of Italian relations and settled on an alliance with Venice. Venice was an old enemy of Naples and had its eye on the city of Ferrare, ruled by a relative of Naples' king. The Pope and Venice joined forces to take the city, which prompted Naples, Milan, Bologna, and other cities to form a coalition against them. While Venice besieged the city, Sixtus's forces fought Naples. Eventually, Sixtus's field commander died and his war effort collapsed. Faced with his shattered pride, a coalition of hostile Italian cities, and Florence still furious at him, Sixtus was running out of options. Worse still, Venice was doing surprisingly well, and Sixtus began to fear that Venice might emerge from the war much more powerful than it began and could be a threat. So, Sixtus stabbed them in the back. Sixtus made peace with Naples and allowed their forces to head to Ferrare to fight off the Venetians. Sixtus demanded the Venetians surrender, and when they refused, he placed them under interdict too. Nevertheless, Venice endured. Sixtus sat the rest of the war out as Venice surprisingly held its own against the alliance. 
Eventually, peace was made with the Treaty of Bagnolo on August 7, 1484. Venice didn't take Ferrare, but they kept much of the territory they had taken and were now more powerful than they'd ever been. The papacy was not invited to the negotiations, and when he heard the terms, Sixtus was apoplectic. Not only had Sixtus been embarrassed with the Pazzi conspiracy in this war, but he'd made enemies of Florence, Naples, and Venice, all of whom were more powerful now than when they began, and he had shattered whatever respect the rest of Italy had for him. Less than a week after the treaty was signed, on August 12, 1484, Sixtus died at the age of 70. Some sources blame his death on the stress caused by the treaty, but it's impossible to know. Pope Sixtus IV embodied everything wrong with the medieval Catholic Church. He was unapologetically corrupt, nepotistic, and politically ambitious. Beautiful as the Sistine Chapel and his works in Rome might have been, they represented the worldly extravagance of the church and were paid for by selling church offices and the forgiveness of sin for mere gold. The Spanish Inquisition, which he founded, would become an infamous symbol of persecution across the world, and his scheming plunged Italy into war. He did succeed in helping some of his family. His nephew Giuliano would even become Pope in 1503, but it came at tremendous cost for everyone else. It's no surprise that when Martin Luther published his 95 Theses and kickstarted the Protestant Reformation, his complaints against the Catholic Church feel like a list of criticisms of Sixtus himself. That's no surprise, since Luther was born mere months before Sixtus died, and would have grown up hearing tales of the misdeeds of his corrupt and controversial papacy. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to keep up to date on future videos. We promise that we'll make everyone who likes and subscribes a cardinal when we finally become Pope. Any day now.